Hello, everyone. Welcome to The Lobby, GameSpot's weekly hangout here at 2 p.m. Pacific in San Francisco. We have a full show today. We are talking about The Division. We're talking about XCOM 2 on consoles. We're going to be talking Titanfall 2. And Eric Tay and I are going to debate my Destiny Rise of Iron review score. But first, <laughs> I have a few housekeeping items. Mary Kish and Alexa Ray Korea, as well as Dan Crowd from our Australian office, went to Tokyo for TGS recently. And we have some giveaways, namely this chocolate crunch that looks kind of like uh, the Mega Man energy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, got a few other things. I'll let, rattle off a few. This is Peter Brown, by the way, and Aaron Sampson. Hi. Um, <laughs> Street Fighter 2 something. What does this say? That's curry, man. Okay, curry. <laughs> um, yeah, so GameSpot's going to tweet photos of these uh, throughout the day, I think, after the show. And uh, basically, just if you want any of this, retweet the photos for a chance to win them. Here's Kingsglaive, Final Fantasy stuff. Pete, can you... Uh, can I? There's a few more things in there, but yeah, just pay attention to GameSpot's Twitter feed, and we will get those to people based on who retweets and whatnot. We also have a Forza Horizon 3 stream by Rob Hanley right after the show. Yeah. Cool. Let's get into it. What Aaron Sanford. make it through customs? I have no idea. That, that's my question. That's like what a sword or something? Anyway. All right. We're going to talk about the division for a specific reason, not just because we have nothing else to talk about. There's a new update in the near future, update 1.4, which... I'll let you describe it a little more, but basically it's a lot of like quality of life changes. But right now it's in public test servers for uh, on Uplay, not Steam yet. Uh, Ubisoft said it would be on Steam soon enough. I don't know, it's in their words. But so tell me, is this like what's up with the update? Why would this bring people back? Why are we talking about the division again? Yeah, I think the big thing going on in the division right now is so they they delayed their DLC um, survival and last stand, and they're trying to get the core game hook. As good as they can, a lot of the things they've done or they're testing right now are quality of life improvements. On the shooting side, they're trying to lower time to kill. They're trying to drop loot that's more relevant to your level and sort of do that Destiny thing where you slowly grind your way up at a pace. Um, they're like increasing ammo. Like I think a lot of what they're trying to get away from on the shooting side is just where you, you literally run out of ammo trying to kill somebody. Um, which is just kind of a boring way to play a shooter. <laughs> yeah, the, I mean, it seemed very much like Destiny when I first played it, uh, in the fact that it was kind of more of an MMO to me because the shooting mechanics, the third person mechanics felt good, but it was more of a, like bullet sponge enemies and like loot gear and whatnot. But I don't know. I I was wondering how much more they would need to do for this to actually become like I, people are. Someone had said it's kind of like the Taken King, like you had said, the way you're kind of just grinding for like levels now instead of going for these specific exotic items, et cetera. Yeah, and, I, you know, I think, again, like, if you're going to have an MMO that's a shooter, you have to start with the best shooting, right? Or else you don't have anything. Which Destiny has really good mechanics. And the reason that Destiny, I think the reason that people stuck with Destiny for so long as a, as a like, year-long beta test up until Taken King was that the core shooting was so good that it was worth sticking around to see what happened with the loot system. Because, like, Destiny was a game where you got to a boss after a long game and you shot them and nothing came out, right? It was just totally busted loot system. Division, it was like a very similar feel. You just didn't feel like you were gaining much of anything as you played, if you played the game kind of casually as it was meant to be played. If you were willing to get into the whole resource grind, like you know someone like Eric Tay did, then you could probably get what you were looking out of it, um, that sense of satisfaction. But I don't know, for a guy like me, I'm a shooter fan. I was looking for good shooting mechanics. And... Time to kill was a big issue. The other big issue, which they have not addressed in this patch yet, or they've not addressed in the public test, is just enemy lack of enemy reaction, right? So if enemies run at you with high-powered weapons, it's a cover-based shooter, and you are the only one who has to take cover. And if they're running straight at you and they don't stagger or have fear or do much of anything, except for a couple of weapons, like the LMG where they'll suppress, then... Like, what do you have? You don't really have a cover-based shooter. Right. Like, you, you just have a game where people charge at you and kill you at point-blank range. Yeah, like the few hours I did play, uh, it was infuriating that people with baseball bats could run up to me, and I could put 10 bullets in them, and they'd still be alive. One hit from that baseball bat would kill me. Yeah. It's like, what? <laughs> it's a very, very off-topic tangent, but I remember that's one reason I didn't like, one of the reasons I didn't like Resident Evil 6, because like for the first time in the series, when you shoot zombies, they're not reacting, yeah. and I there didn't feel like there's any impact, and I want in a shooter, I want to feel that impact. Like Destiny, you get the headshots, a lot of times their head explodes, like you get, they drop an item, uh, you know, you kind of, when you knife them, they go flying, it makes sense, it feels like you're actually affecting the enemies in the game world, and I remember that too, because I just, I was watching the health bar, not the enemy, as I was just unloading yeah. magazine after magazine into them, and I guess my question is, what 
this pushed the DLC back, like you were saying. Uh, Survival, the next planned one, is like later this year at some point, and uh, Last Stand is next year now, 2017. Uh, do you think this update will be worth getting into, or do you think people are still better off waiting for the DLC? I, I think what's going to bring people back is the DLC, and I'm guessing that their intention is that they'll retain those people with better quality of life. So um, they're also making other things easier in this game. So in addition to, to new content that they made, it may or may not be good. I don't know. Like, that's still up to them. Um, they're doing small things like, you know, weapon skins used to take up all of your inventory space. So if you wanted cool skins for your weapons, you had to give up, like, tangible items in the game. Um, they didn't have basic stuff like bulk conversion at crafting stations that they're trying to get in now. So you would spend, like, tons of time pressing each one to break it down. Um, the big one that that is a big deal for me is locking items, which is something that's been in Destiny for a while. But you could very easily have accidentally deleted a lot of your high-level gear in this game if you marked a bunch of stuff to delete it to break it down, but you were accidentally clicked on your gun that you were using, which is common, and you hit delete whatever you marked. It would also delete your main gun. And it didn't tell you that that was equipped or that was your best it, gun? There wasn't like a warning, hey, you're about to delete your favorite whatever. So like these quality of life improvements give the game the potential that if the next DLC has enough content that people will stick around after that and continue the the leveling grind and they might enjoy the lower time to kill and like just the general shooting better. So it's it's an opportunity for them. That being said, I don't know. Their first DLC will, just should have been called A Room, like DLC The Room, because that's all it was. Their incursion was just like a place you walk into. You saw the boss right away. It was just standing there. Yeah. And... The only thing that that mode did was flush you out of cover and a cover-based shooter continuously until you killed the thing at the other end of the room, and it just wasn't wasn't compelling. So in terms of the actual progression, this seems like, like you had mentioned, it might be more like, we're going to talk about Rise of Iron later, it seems like it's more of a uh, gradual grind, kind of, in terms of progression, and like you said, not someone that's min-maxing and actually knowing exactly what item to get and how to kind of maximize that item's capabilities. Now it's more of, if you want to play casually a lot, you, you will build your character. Yeah, go kill Bullet King once a day. You can go um, do the new underground DLC, which I think is probably the best way to get loot um, for casual players. Again, like you just go through it, you get great loot every day. Um, the Dark Zone, I think, is still kind of a mess. Like, I don't know why I would play the Dark Zone as opposed to underground DLC because I'm guaranteed loot in the underground. Whereas the Dark Zone, you work really hard and then somebody just kind of sh- shoots you in the back. Yeah, And then they even patch it so like even if you get your stuff on the line, you get away. They can still just come back and cut the line, take your stuff. Mm -hmm. But it's hard to tell. Um, They started everybody off in the public test server with a base character. Uh, It was a base level character. Mm -hmm. So nobody's gotten their new vector or whatever yet. So we still can't tell. Maybe the dark zone is still pretty busted. Won't be able to know for a couple weeks until people get the the new stuff again. Yeah, I mean, I only played a few hours of this game, and uh, the reason I liked it, and I think the reason it was initially appealing to me before it released, was just the game world. This decrepit New York City mm-hmm. that, you know, like, you had spent a lot of time when you were younger. Not a decrepit New York City, but New York City. No, a decrepit New York City. Yeah, you hung out in the slums, yeah. and as you would. But no, we, uh, I, that's, I think this is what I've been waiting for. The DLC was never interesting to me. Some, like, big revamp that would actually make the game fun to me yeah. was what I was waiting for. So I'm wondering... It doesn't sound like this is enough, but maybe I'll still try, go back and play an hour and see if it's like gripping me. But I mean, we have a lot of games coming out, but The Division was all is the one this year that I feel like I didn't give a chance. I don't know. Are you interested in going back at all? Yes. No, I mean, because I, I did try to give it a chance. I spent like f- maybe three to four hours with the game. And I, sort of the problems I described earlier were the things that turned me off. But yes, the world is interesting. I like the concept of people sort of like meeting in this camp to like go out on these missions and like that's all great. Um, so yeah, like if the, the sort of like small moment to moment stuff is improved and streamlined and made just to feel more fun, uh, I, I could see wanting to play it again. But it, for me, it's almost like that time has passed, mm-hmm. um, which sucks because there are so many good games that are just good no matter when you try to play them. Um, but yeah, The Division, I mean, I'd, I feel like I'd have to start over at mm-hmm. this point. So it would have to do a lot to get me to start over. It's interesting because... I mean, you, you mentioned starting over. I think when Taken King came out, a lot of us were jealous of people who maybe never played Destiny before. Yeah. Because they were getting the full experience. They were getting the originally, the most, the most of what the original design was for that game. Yeah. And that's how I understood the division. I thought Ubisoft was making more of a platform kind of to maybe like once a year, like Destiny released this expansion or like that's actually going to revamp things and kind of change how you think the game works and how the game works and like not the mechanics, but the actual systems at play. 
And I think that's what I'm waiting for for the division. And this doesn't seem substantial enough. I mean, it's only in public test servers right now, but it doesn't seem ex- substantial enough for me to jump back in, especially like with other games on the horizon. But I don't know. I kind of like the DLC just doesn't appeal to me because, again, that's just the same game with more content, especially judging by the room. It doesn't sound like there's much promise there. And also the public test servers aren't always necessarily for that game. Um, the Battlefield 4 public test server realistically was to make the next Battlefield game better. And Division did sell extremely well, and this may be for them to fix everything for the next Division game. I mean, I don't know. They could walk at this point, and I think it would still be a success, um, at least financially for their company. And they could make a better sequel if they wanted to, um, learning from the public test in the meantime. Yeah. Well, that is the update 1.4 public test servers. The update is not officially out yet. Uh, that is available on Uplay, and it will be on Steam at some point. Ubisoft has not said when yet, but they said it will be soon. So go check that out and let us think. Let us know what you think in the comments <laughs> below. Let All us right. think about. We, the we let think us anyway. think more about this game. All right, Aaron, thanks for coming on. I thanks, appreciate Mike. your division expertise. We're gonna bring Scott Butterworth on in a second. Pete, how's uh, how are things going this week with you? Things gonna be going better, man. <laughs> yeah. No, things are good. You I'm looked, happy. You look concerned before this. I'm started. concerned. There's a lot going on today. Like a lot of it's very interesting. Uh, it's kind of compounded by the fact that next week I'm taking off and mm-hmm. uh, be gone for a couple weeks. To the outback. Just going to the outback. I need a lot of steak and blooming onions. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> You're going to China and Japan, right? Yeah. Nice. Yeah. I've never been. They sound cool though. They are cool. <laughs> Scott Butterworth, what's up? He's right. They're very cool. Have yes. you been? They're way cooler than being here in the office. Yeah. This office <laughs> so is I'm very boring. jealous. But um, uh, it's nice being here on this on the lobby set. This yeah. is nice. Yeah. Got, got the nice mood lighting. We have the SS Pikmin yeah. to enjoy. So, you know, that's good. Talking about Titanfall 2. Titanfall 2. Uh, you recently went down, I think, did you go down to uh, their studio? Uh, Respawn yeah, yeah, studio in Chatsworth? down at Respawn. Yep. Cool. Yeah, and uh, you got to pretty much see, uh, you saw some single player, which we can't talk about, I don't think. Correct, yeah. I, I actually got to play a pretty substantial portion of the, like the complete campaign, but yeah, that is still embargoed until a little later this week. So check back on, I don't know if I'm allowed to say the embargo, but yeah. later this week, we'll say maybe around Thursday. Just keep refreshing the GameSpot homepage yeah, never over stop. and over. <laughs> yeah. yeah, just for the rest of your just, life. Exactly. Just have your phone at all times, just walk and refresh and <laughs> So, great. so we, uh, so but. Rob and I have gotten to play uh, a, a lot of it too. We did a preview series on it, kind of like a two-part series on how this is kind of like they're trying to mis- uh, correct mistakes they made with the first Titanfall, but also like how this is becoming almost like a hero shooter in my view of how like the Titans are designed and how it becomes like a, you can see a Titan signature moves and you can see you know like how to counteract them and they can see yours and it's kind of like a chess match almost at that point but you got to see all six titans finally yeah yeah and actually got to play all six as well um so it wasn't just like here's a trailer because they they put trailers up uh, a couple weeks ago to kind of vaguely introduce what each of the new titans does but yeah so the multiplayer you have a choice of any of the six titans um and and yeah i mean i wouldn't necessarily call it like a hero shooter more maybe like a class-based shooter because each of the titans does seem to kind of represent a different class in a way um at least if you go uh, judge them according to like their primary weapons. Like, for example, Ronan has a shotgun and a sword. Like, those are his primary weapons. So he's clearly like the up-close damage dealer. He's that kind of tank type, so right? phase shift, too, right? That can go yeah, behind Yeah, phase people. shift is really cool. Um, yeah, like, so pilots have a cloak ability, but this is not that. This is a different thing. Basically, like, you just blink out of existence entirely. Like, you don't even have a shadow that people can track. Like, you're just simply not there. So you can't be damaged. You can't be seen. It only lasts a few seconds, though, and when you're in that state... Uh, you actually can't see your opponents. You just see like a black and white kind of version of the world and can maneuver. So it's useful for a couple of reasons. Like my my favorite was to just charge straight at people. And as soon as they kind of like got me in their sight, I would blink out of existence and continue to rush at them in like the parallel dimension. And then when I snapped back into reality, I was suddenly like right in their face. With a sword and shotgun. Exactly. So that was really fun and really awesome. But then in contrast to someone like Northstar, who I think uh, Rob's a big fan of, and that character, like that character's base weapon is essentially a sniper rifle. It's Mm -hmm. like the exact opposite where you want to play the spacing game. You want to hang back. And, and not only is it a, it's, it's a rail gun, so it charges up over time. So you really can't be in people's face with that character. You have to hang back. You have to bide your time. Um, so yeah, in my mind, it, it is kind of class-based. You have a tank, you have a sniper, you have the shotgun, running gunner, like all these different types and, and, and play styles. So whatever you're into, there's probably a Titan that'll loosely fit what you want to get out of the game. Yeah. And then like North Star, just to backtrack quickly, is that the one that has a kind of Pharah, justice from above, rains from above? Yeah, attack? totally. Yeah. As you mentioned, so each of the Titans has sort of an ultra ability and like once so over the course of a round as you like accumulate damage and do other things to contribute to your team you eventually unlock their ultra 
Mm -hmm. um, and yes, yeah, so in North Star's case, it's essentially like a Farah death from above, oh. like VTOL hover plus like homing missile barrage. Uh, it's pretty awe inspiring. Is it referred to as an ultra? I don't honestly like. I'm trying to remember. Um, so each I, Titan has a core ab like ability. Okay. They're described as like yeah. he's the sword core. Yeah. Let's uh, let's stop latching onto new terms. This is a class based thing, like you said, which I'm happy about. This is not hero shooter. Oh, like 100%. No, this is, is a class based shooter. You build up experience and these are not throughout alts. the match. These are. It's an alt. Oh, this oh dude, my God. Okay. If you could open up, reference only if goes you back could to open Overwatch. up a cannon out of your chest <laughs> and shoot a laser out of it, what would you, that's not a, that's not ultimate. I would call that's it a core something ability. Else. That's a core ability. All right. Anyway, Fuck, let's call it a limit break. I mean, for that, all I that, that, that turn was around anyway. before Overwatch. No, I mean, but it's no, but it's goes back to like early Street Fighter. And like, it's a Dota term. <sighs> yeah. Exactly. I don't know. So when MOBAs were invented, then we didn't know. Um, but okay. we like to call them? I believe they're called core abilities. There you That's go. That's just not yeah. as... So nobody knows what that means outside of this context, though. Like if, if we sit and explain, so a core call ability... Call it a super. Call it a super. Okay. It just sounds like they have really nice so abs. So Titan has a super. <laughs> Yeah, they, they they all sit on those stupid Derail balls all day and it really <laughs> works their midsection and they'll yeah really taught abs. Look for the nice. hot calendar coming out next year. Cool, it's be real uh, real sexy. Do you have like a favorite Titan? Because you said there was one that's kind of like just to piss Pete off. I'm going to use another Overwatch. <laughs> you did say there's like a Soldier 76 and like Call of Duty like kind of every man character uh, Titan that like anybody that's played a shooter will get. Yeah. So um, one of the Titans, I'm trying to remember if it's a uh, Legion or Tone. I believe it's Legion has a sort of minigun mm -hmm. and a really good all around mix of like health, damage, and speed. So they that that particular character is you know just sort of e well balanced, equally. Uh, I mean, it's just. Doesn't serve a, a, as deep a niche purpose as somebody like North Star who really has to hang back, or someone like Ronan who really has to be up close mm -hmm. to be effective. Um, the minigun is like has an up close uh, switch, or like you can change its firing mode. Sorry to backtrack. You can change its firing mode, so you can fire either like a steady stream of bullets or a wider spray. So he's useful from a variety of different ranges. He again has uh, strong movement and health, so you can kind of play him as more of a standard mid mid range shooter character. Okay. Um, it'll be a good, I think, intro for people because everybody immediately understands how a minigun works, right? Like it charges up, you fire a bunch of bullets, things in front of you die. Even that character's super uh, is <laughs> like an amped <laughs> version. It, it's really nothing too different. Like you just fire slightly more powerful bullets. So it's not like, oh, you take off and are raining bullets or, mm -hmm. oh, you phase shift out of existence. It's, oh, your bullets are just more powerful. So gotcha. again, really easy Damage to understand, buff. really like low barrier to entry for that particular character, mm -hmm. but still totally fun to play. Because again, who doesn't love a minigun and just like, completely shredding everything in the environment. Yeah. Um, Ronan, unfortunately, has very limited health, though, so yeah. uh, I would generally, like, get up close, take down one Titan, and then be it basically at the point of death, but you can still e equip uh, Nuclear Eject, which people may remember from the previous game. So It's pronounced Nuclear. Nuclear Eject. <laughs> I'm pretty sure it's the, uh, so the foliage at yeah. the library. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Where was I going with this? Uh, debate, don't have yeah. This has been a really like here. derailment <laughs> heavy episode today. Um, what the hell was I talking about? Ronan. Does the overall flow? Oh yeah, you can blow good? up. You blow up and take people down with you. It's awesome. So it doesn't matter you have very little health because as soon as you die, you explode and everything around you is incinerated. Oh cool, like awesome. a, like a, okay, cool. So how does it feel overall? Do these feel balanced? Does the flow of the multiplayer still feel intact with six people instead of just the two we've seen so far? Yeah, well actually, so... Um, I, to me, it feels way more complete and way more interesting than the beta did. The beta obviously was missing a lot of content. I mean, you only had two, two of the six Titans, but also there were a bunch of missing maps and a, a bunch of missing pilot abilities. So I wanted to talk about that as well, because the game is more than just Titans, obviously. Sure. Um, and I know a lot of people um, that I've spoken to about the beta came away thinking like, oh man, why would you ever play with anything but the grappling hook? The grappling hook kind of changes the game completely for pilots. It's, mm -hmm. you know, suddenly wall running or free running is no longer as, as essential as it was. But on some of the new maps, I found that the grappling hook wasn't even that useful in a way. Like there's a really dense new map called Eden where I found that it was dense enough, there were enough objects to sort of wall jump off of that I was able to make my way through the city and keep my momentum up without ever relying on the grappling hook, which meant that I could use that skill slot on something else. And there are other abilities that are actually like appealing and useful, some more than others. I was I was sticking to that like sonar pulse knife. Dude, I actually really I like that. The, Maybe yes. that just comes from like my background and just shooters in general like knowing where people are is obviously a huge deal yeah and i think i was just more comfortable with that and it's like i could rely on the really fine-tuned wall traversal and like wall runs and like vaults and i didn't have to worry about the grappling hook yeah whereas the knife i could just throw 
stand still, see if anybody's above me, below me, around me, or just on the run, just see if anybody's about to ambush me. I don't know. I I didn't think the grappling hook was as huge of a deal as a lot of people did. It's cool. It's fun. But and I feel I think it feels great. But I wasn't like one of those people that was you know kind of you know like you said being attached to it. Yeah, I'm I'm actually kind of with you. Attached to it, grapple. That's good. Um, yeah, there are certain maps where it makes a lot of sense. Peter was shaking his head. I don't know if he was on camera right there, but that was, that was the correct reaction, Peter. Um, yeah, there are certain maps where it makes a lot of sense because uh, the maps now, I, I would argue, have more verticality than the maps did in the first game. So um, if you are down like deep in a trench and you're trying to get to the top of a building and there's like a large uh, scalable section... You may not be able to wall jump your way up that, but the grappling hook can save you a bunch of time. And boom, mm -hmm. hey, you can suddenly traverse a section of the level that other pilots can't. Yeah. Very useful, but not every map has that. Um, so the, like I said, there are plenty of situations where the grappling hook is going to be less useful than other skills. Sure. So I think once people get a chance to play all of the content together and see how it all fits together, uh, and see how all the different tactics complement one another, they'll realize that it's, it's a bit more of a complete product mm -hmm. than the beta was. And I don't know that it made it, I'm not guaranteeing that everybody who hated the beta is actually going to love the full game. People might still hate it. But I, I personally enjoyed what I was able to play last week much more than I enjoyed the beta, in, in large part because there's so much more going on and there's so much more strategy. And if you see the other team is using certain types of titans, you can pick a titan to give yourself an advantage over that type because you can switch between deaths. And just that ability to switch on the fly and adjust your tactics and change all this stuff and having all these options really makes the game kind of more rich. But all this essential stuff is there. There's still mech battles. There's still wall running and you know all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. It's still Titanfall to me, even if certain things have changed. But cool. yeah, I mean, I had a lot of fun with it. I, I really enjoyed my time. Cool. So you got your full like preview stuff up on GameSpot. Your single player stuff is coming later this week and we'll be able to talk more about how the Titans work there and how the yeah. story's unfolding and whatnot. Full profile on all the Titans went up last week. People should definitely go check that out. Rob Handler did an amazing job editing together a video conversation that we had. And yeah, okay. single player stuff going up later this week. <laughs> Rob's in the Room. That's why I insulted him. But cool. Hey, there he is. That so that, guy. <laughs> so that is Titanfall 2. Uh, like Scott said, he's got his content up on the site right now. Uh, we have single player stuff coming later this week, and that releases October 28th for PS4 or Xbox One. And uh, we can see how it, like the beta, was indicative of the game then. And PC. And PC. Sorry, forgot that one. Thanks. A lot, I know Scott. that people would yell at you if you didn't say that. They definitely so. would. Got cool. Your, got your back, man. I All appreciate right. it, Scott. Gonna... Thanks for talking. We're gonna have Rob come on. Bye, guys. I'm, I'm excited for Titanfall 2. It's fun. <laughs> Are you excited for the next time I want to derail this conversation? You, if, I dare you to go ahead and try it. Oh, I will. Okay, fine. I can, and I will. All right, whatever. Rob Hanley, what's up? <laughs> uh, not a whole lot. Just got my little notes here for the next segment. The next segment? A game you haven't really played? What are we talking about first? XCOM 2. Yeah. Okay, cool. cool. Have you no. played XCOM 2? Uh, no, not cool. really. Well, I brought you on to lob questions at me because I played a lot cool. of it. Cool. Anyway. Cool. So that's the intro. We're talking about XCOM 2. I've played a lot of it. It's on consoles as of today, PS4, Xbox One. Uh, released back in February. I think it was 27th, 17th. There was a 7 somewhere in there. It's important I really that we get it. the day yeah. correct. Yeah, I'm not going to screw that up. You're trying to derail this already. <laughs> no, it was a very good game. I liked it a lot. I gave it a 9. Uh, one of the, like, my favorite strategy games I've ever played. In terms of being a sequel, I think it's everything I wanted. It took the familiarity from XCOM Enemy Unknown and just kind of made the strategy layer of base building and like traveling around the map and resource uh, management deeper and made the tactics kind of even more varied with this many more like options and nuance to it. Um, like the storyline was just there to facilitate the action, but it was just all around like a challenging game that I love playing every second of. Uh, I know you guys have not spent much time with it, but I just want, we just, uh, it's out on console. We want to talk about whether it's worth returning to on consoles for people who have played it or it's worth just playing. If you have not played it yet. Well, I don't know, Mike. Is I'm going to shill the <laughs> hell out of this game because I know a lot of people in our office haven't like gotten the chance to play it yet, Yeah. Um, which is unfortunate. I think it's just because, again, it just released on PC and uh, Enemy Unknown was just on consoles right away. Um, and I wish that wasn't the case, but now I'm hoping the console release will get this game in more people's hands because it's a very good game. Um, do you guys have any interest in trying it now that it's on console? Um, well, my first question is, is like how... You know, for a XCOM game and many other like just like strategy games, you want that like fluid mouse work. Mm -hmm. Like that's very important. I feel like for clicking for such a heavy HUD, how does that work? Is I mean, is it is it a cursor? I mean, I would imagine it's it's you snap around, right? You yeah, you move like the analog stick moves it through the tiles and then the line of like where the soldier will move based on where you put it. So if you put it here, it's going to show the line going around this crate and around this one. It's definitely not as fluid; it's just a mouse. But it like f to be on consoles, it feels very good. You know, you can kind of uh, they're like hot buttons you press to go into Overwatch. Uh, you know, like to guard your teammates. There are certain buttons to use different abilities. 
the the button mappings feel really natural. Um, mm. The keyboard, obviously, the same thing. You could work those out just as easily. But like mouse cursor, the, the more you play with the analog sticks, the less you kind of notice. Uh, it's not the ideal way to play it, but it looks just as good as on PS4, Xbox One. From what I noticed, uh, there you go. You can see how it's wrapping around objects, and you know, like you get two turns most characters unless they have special abilities and everything. But it, it feels really good. It's it's fast. It's not. It doesn't feel cumbersome when you're trying okay. to like plan out your moves. Uh, but it it has made the transition well in terms of uh, the interface from in my experience. What's the deal? What's your hunch? Why did this take so long? I don't know. They de- they delayed it. What was it like last earlier this month or last month they were originally going to release it? Yeah, but I mean, even just then, like months removed from the PC version when Enemy Unknown. Oh was right, because they've been talking for like a year before it released on PC that it's like it's developed. It's developed for PC, and a lot of people thought that meant it's only coming to PC. And but then, like you start looking at it, they're like, no, it's just saying they developed it from the ground up for PC. They never said they weren't gonna like port it or whatever, or bring yeah. it over to consoles. I don't know. You're like the tech guy. Why would it be? Would that could the tech play into that at all? I I don't know what tools they're using to make these games, but I mean the architecture on the new consoles is very similar to what most people and most developers develop for on PC. Yeah. So I guess that's why I'm slightly confused. Mm-hmm. Um, why it took so long, and I kind of feel bad that it took so long because in the slew of new releases this might actually get lost and it does Mm -hmm. sound like such a great game um i mean you loving like final fantasy tactics they're very different games but i keep telling you like in terms of like the combat and the tactics i think you'd love this game i think i would too and i think it coming to console will make it easier for me to play just because it's pc gaming at home just isn't as simple for me as it is in the office and when i'm here a lot of other stuff going on Mm -hmm. so i want to play it like uh, yeah well i mean what are the things people should know because yes, it's a nine, but 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 what sort of problems does the game maybe have? Not to paint it in a negative light, mm-hmm. but but yeah, like what's the full story? Some technical issues have like migrated from PC that were there. I I haven't played PC in a while. I don't know if they're still present. Uh, a lot of times you'll start a turn and then you'll like initiate an attack. It'll zoom in into the action camera and you'll hear the action going on, but the character will be frozen in place for like sometimes up to ten seconds. And it's nothing game breaking, but every once in a while it tests your patience. Uh, a lot of, sometimes like. Enemies will be able to shoot through walls they should not be able to shoot through. And like I've known this game well enough to know that they don't have this upgrade or they don't that right. alien can't do that. Um, that happens every once in a while. So hmm. that was one of my initial complaints on PC is every once in a while, like not enough to hinder the overall experience, but sometimes the enemies will ignore the rules that you have to abide by. Hmm. Which like the odds are stacked against you in this game. That's the whole point. You're rising right. up against this like overpowered alien occupation force and you're like this squad of rebel fighters, but in general, none of these technical issues uh, impacted the game on PC from back in the day. Again, I don't know if they have addressed them, but even on console, like I experienced a few of them in the few hours I played just to double check that consoles work well. Yeah. Um, but yeah, they, I, in terms of maybe that was a problem they had bringing to consoles. If they did like fully port it, maybe they had more a month ago that they had to kind of fix. Sure. I have no idea. Is there any incentive for someone on PC who is a huge fan of XCOM to come back? To a console, so that's like you know, they have an audience. It, it just seems like a missed. I think Peter kind of said it like a missed opportunity to like have these come out more succinct or like more you know in a similar deadline. If you if you just want an excuse, if you like have like if you have it on PC, no, there's not much reason because it comes with the DLC, which PC obviously already has. PC mm-hmm. also has mods, which I was showing you. I got like Star Wars mods. You can make the guys look like Boba Fett. You can get the Halo guns, which actually have different stats. They're not just skins. Um, like that's why DLC kind of became a little less relevant with this big game because the mod support was out from the beginning so people could make really cool stuff. Um, but like Alien Hunters, uh, Anarchy's Children, and there's one more that I'm forgetting, uh, are present on the console release. So if you already played it on PC, if you already own it, not much incentive to come back unless you're like me and just like need an excuse to play it again for a little bit. Uh, if you don't have it on PC and you're like, if you're a console player, I was like, go buy this game it's well worth the $60 or the full packages with the DLC and everything and I highly encourage it when did the last DLC come out because it sounds like that might be the thing that they were just taking care of before uh, if it was before. I think it was Alien Hunters then Anarchy's Children uh, and then there might be one more but it was about two months ago I think and that was the one where uh, it was kind of uh, like the, you made them look like uh, Mad Max characters kind of it was like oh. character customization stuff um, but it was maybe that was what they were delaying for to make sure they got all the DLC Who out. Who knows? But but that could be. Yeah. I mean that's how a lot of development studios work. I know like Bethesda when they're working on, from what I understand, Bethesda a lot of times they'll have they'll keep their like Fallout Three team on until the DLC is done, and then yeah. migrate them over Fallout Four team on until DLC is done, then bring them over to you know whatever game they're working on next. I don't know. I don't want to 
sound like I do, but yeah, I have no idea. I, it is kind of a shame that it's coming out right now when like you have, I don't know, Gears 4 is on the way, FIFA just came out. Those crowds don't really overlap, but then you have <laughs> Battlefield 1, Titanfall 2, Call of Duty, Dishonored 2. The Watch Dogs 2. Watch Dogs 2. Mafia 3 is, Mafia 3 is the next big one, I think. Yep. Yeah. Well, I think we're doing like a section on the next episode or an episode down the road, like our favorite holiday. Civ 2, right? Civ 6, uh, same day as uh, Battlefield 1, October 21st. Yeah. <laughs> Those are different audiences, though. <laughs> yeah. Still, though, it's yeah. a slew of games. Yeah, totally. Yeah. So, XCOM 2 is on console now, PS4, Xbox One. It was on PC back in P- uh, February. But if you haven't played it on PC and if you want to get like the whole package with uh, the, all the DLCs, I highly recommend it. Go check out our review on GameSpot. Give it a 9 out of 10. That is XCOM 2. Guys, go play it. Don't be a dummy. Play some XCOM. Yeah. For your health. For your health. <laughs> go to it. All right. <laughs> Speaking of Battlefield 1. <laughs> Rob, you just watched the story trailer. I watched the story trailer. Pete watched the story trailer. I think we have differing opinions. Oh, really? From my... What, oh, like, I don't know. Pete sits near me and I heard his reaction. Oh, of course, like it was curmudgeon. Like, oh, sick story trailer. <laughs> What'd I you think of it? it? I was into it. You liked it? Um, <laughs> I was into it because... Geez, where to start? I don't know. I was into it because we've seen the gameplay for the most part. I think we all know what this game is. This game's going to look pretty good. Yeah. Okay, just based on the beta alone, I feel like. Um... And I was interested where they were going to take this depressing ass war yeah. uh, and how they're going to present it. And in jet, like, I mean, you know, it wasn't like a, you know, a huge explanation of the plot or anything, but you saw a lot of these conflicting moments with like, do I shoot? Do I not kill you? Do I do, you know, and, and I think that's the, the battle of, um, you know, uh, people's opinions of the war in general. Like, why were we fighting? Right. Um, and that seems to be apparent in this. It's also like Dice's challenge. Like, how do you depict one of the bloodiest conflicts ever? Yeah. yeah. But there's there's a, there's the other side of the coin where, yes, there is that peop- that thing where people are like, oh, man, this war, what are we doing? But on the other hand, there's a guy like, we will go into battle, and if one out mm-hmm. of every thousand of us is remembered, imagine the war stories that will be told yeah. for ages to come. <laughs> I have conflicting emotions. Cool. <laughs> I have very conflicting emotions because the first half seems like they're going for a more personal level and right. maybe how it's going to affect them. And then there's a there's a part in the middle where the music dies down and it starts getting grim. I'm like, oh, this is awesome. Like it's these people coming into war. Like everybody's romanticizing it. They're like, we're going to like storm no man's land. We're going to get across. And then I thought it was going to cut de- back to like the grisly aspects of it, the shit that like you don't want to see that I was hoping Dice would put in. But then it just cut right back to that like that speech you just telling. But it's like. Yeah. Uh, if we fight, like if we push, we can win or something like a sure. like a locker room speech before a World War One battle. Yeah, like the game looks great. It looks better in this trailer than it does in motion, and that's saying a lot because in motion it looks fantastic. But in terms of the story I'm getting from it, I just don't feel like I'm getting. I, there's enough for me to really feel confident about it because these are these are such small snippets that they're providing us. Sure. I do like that this trailer. Like I don't know if it's that they're actually going to follow through, but the trailer kind of hints at a character driven campaign which like in the past battlefields have pretty much been like that macho military one shooter dude. jargon stuff yeah. one dude versus all so this one is what there's you said there's five characters there is five perspectives of the war and i was actually hoping for um a side uh, a perspective from the central power side mm-hmm. may it be german or um, ottoman empire ottoman empire sure. but this apparently is all allied so uh having like broken some of the sound the, the battlefield uh put this on their site so i kind of skimmed through it so like the the two british pilots that's your one perspective that's more or less a chapter of this single player campaign you have your tank crew which <laughs> having read it it <laughs> it seems to be almost the exact same idea of the movie fury i was gonna uh, say it's yeah, like it, and, yeah. and <laughs> from the beginning from the first trailer from e3 i was i had a vibe of that you know being stranded in a tank with your treads out with shia labeouf <laughs> <laughs> straight up it's very much that in that they talk about in a, in a very brief uh uh moment they said like uh with the character you, that you are playing or seeing is a newbie who is being introduced to this rugged unprofessional mm. tank crew et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and he's trying to basically, you know, build a team. Yeah. You have different, you know, you have the bromance and the planes, basically these two guys like, don't, will you take me back home? Like, I'll do my best. I will hold you. Yeah. <laughs> I think there's that's a, great there's though. A, there's a shirtless volleyball scene. <laughs> yeah. yeah, very much so. Uh, and then it goes as far to Italian um, perspective in the Alps. Mm-hmm. Uh, Farewell to arms-ish kind of place. It seemed to be the moments of when the guy's putting on that heavy armor. It's like a, they're calling it like a mountaineer regiment called Ar- Arditi, 
I guess, is mm. like the Italian force that's like a almost like comparison to shock troopers from like mm -hmm. um, World War Two. Maybe that's where like flamethrowers come into play or something. I think so. You'll, you'll, that's where you'll see a lot of that action. And then um, the last being, uh, and the, probably one of the most depressing moments in the war is um, Gallipoli. Yeah. Gal yeah. And so you you participate in that as the Australian runners. So yeah. you are running info from probably trenches to trench. Yeah. A lot of chaos. And you get snips of those, I believe. Kind of look like landing crafts, um, you know, storming that um, Ottoman Empire. Well, that was the uh, entire focus man. of the movie, Gallipoli, with uh, like Mel Gibson. It was right. on like carriers and like how like just to get from trench to trench and whatnot. And uh, yeah, it was like the failed attempt for the uh, Australians to kind of end the war early, at least on the Ottoman front. Mm -hmm. So that's interesting. Wasn't there a Bedouin woman they kept showing and mentioning? Yes, mm -hmm. that's the other one. Uh, and I didn't know this. That is very much, they, they're saying that she is like Lawrence of Arabia's right-hand woman. Uh. Or man, whatever you want to call that phrase. But yeah, she's there like the whole step away. Um, and they're basically against the Ottoman Empire. Has You see a lot of these, that's where the train um, behemoths come in mm -hmm. with the heavy artillery. I guess they're, they're trying to make a push on that. Mm -hmm. And obviously that's in like the desert setting. Yeah horseback and it's, stuff like that it seems like not just like in terms of the characters but in terms of their archetypes it's kind of dividing the character classes up mm -hmm. by campaigns you said there's the guy in the italian alps who's kind of more of the uh, assault mm -hmm. uh you it sounds like the gallipoli messengers are more of the scout classes almost it sounds like totally. they're a lot of more stealth probably like behind enemy lines bonus. sure yeah and then there's the harlem hellfighter did you, did, so, did you already mention that i don't know about much about that but what i do know is so that's five chapters more or less with missions being in those and then the, there's a unnamed kind of epilogue which has only a handful of missions so i wonder if that's gonna tie in any or, or any other loose threads to the story of the campaign and then yeah they showed the last shot of the trailer of the harlan Hell hellfighter against like a german soldier kind of standoff yeah both hesitating to pull the trigger and whatnot like yeah. uh, a lot of people i think said when they heard they're making this game they're like would that be awesome if the server shut down on christmas for the christmas truce it wouldn't happen but that'd be really cool but the Harlem Hellfighter, I remember when they first announced the, like the collector's edition, they said something about the Harlem Hellfighters was Pat, part of a DLC. Yeah. Sure. Well, they wouldn't they wouldn't put an epilogue in DLC, would they? No, but they could put the epilogue to tease something for DLC. Well, right. There's, there's been leaks or I think someone like cracked open like the the beta itself and found that there was like a patch that said like French patch. I, or I don't even know if uh, Dice or anyone has even said that there will be like a French DLC um, down the road. Huh. I mean, I I know they said they're trying to go to like un like unexplored territory for World War One in, in terms of like in like media and entertainment, but I feel like they've got San Quentin Scar, the multiplayer map, which is already in France. Like France is like where some of the bloodiest battles took place. I, I have a hard as a, time as like a a, a a team to play as play as. Oh, gotcha. So like yeah. an actual like side. Okay, right. that'd be cool if it was like the attack on Paris when they had to start using taxi cabs to get people up to the front because the Schlieffen plan. They just Germans fucked it up. They're supposed to. They were supposed to wrap around Paris, come from behind. They could have won the war like right then, but then this dude got really bold and came down right at Paris. It's uh, Damn. it's one of the points where we could have completely lost. Dang. Yeah. Yeah, Dang. but uh, just touching back, like I, I, that bummed me out a little bit. I, yeah, as as a huge fan of like 1942, playing as both sides. Um, if that's only present in multiplayer, that's kind of it's kind of a bummer to me because mm -hmm. I would like to see that other perspective. Yeah. Especially, you know, World War One, you there is a different perspective there, more so than World War Two, which is always, you know, as we said, like the higher the man sized as like good versus evil. Yeah. Right. Um but yeah, I mean it, it more or less it the trailer was very yeah. I mean I, I just I got bits of it and I and I and it, it felt pretty cool. It looked pretty cool. There were these these moments of, you know, heavy fog in the forest like that almost remind me of like a call that one of the, what was the call of duty modern warfare sniper mission all gillied up yeah all gillied up just like i don't know i just feel like there's gonna be these moments of that and I, i'm just that made me excited yeah the um, with the gallipoli scouts he looked yeah. like a grizzled old dude from what they showed the right. one i was thinking of like with a rifle and the cape i don't know i'm kind of hoping there are some measure moments in the campaign not just all out like charging trenches like you're doing multiplayer or not just trenches multiplayer but just charging like control points and whatnot i'm interested how they're gonna kind of trend like transplant the battlefield formula into a campaign because they in my opinion they've kind of failed recently they in meant all, all the yeah and that and how linear they are more yeah. or less and yeah. they've been saying they're gonna do like more sandbox area areas yeah. and make it a more battlefield campaign at least mm -hmm. that's what their marketing is saying but i hope they do to try to f translate that like actual this battlefield you're playing on into the campaign rather than just this long line of like follow this character and sure do this. 
Yeah, they mentioned a, f- a few scenarios in like their uh, release today, their press release. Where you know, one was like, you know, you come across a German tank, you can either destroy it or you can hotwire it, you know, and use it against you know X or mm-hmm. vice versa, like storming an artillery encampment. You can turn the guns the other way. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was like, okay, cool, that's exciting. But yeah, because I mean, I remember one of, the, one of the most frustrating parts of uh, Battlefield Four, or was it three? I keep forgetting. Um, was when you, oh man, it's aircraft carrier scene, and you're about, you knew you and your buddy are pilots, and you're going up to your like F eighteen, and you get in the back, and you don't even fly. <laughs> yeah, you just point missiles in certain directions. Mm-hmm. I was point and clicking. I think I literally stopped playing the campaign after yeah. that because that made me so upset. Well, that's why, like I said, like just to double down on what I'm saying, I hope that they find some way to make it like a sandbox where you don't have to be in a plane in this set piece moment because that's very like a Call of Duty thing when I think of. I hope they're not just going to say, you're in a plane for the entirety of this mission, shooting shooting down like enemy planes and dogfights. I hope they say, here's your objective, go capture that with these people and then there'll be a story thing to tr- like kind of contextualize this. If you want to get in a plane, go do it. They are pilots, so I'm assuming like it's probably going to be a behind enemy lines moment or something when they're like down behind enemy lines. I think you see some of that. I think yeah. it was the clip where the guy was about to hit him with like a yeah, <laughs> look like a uh, what do you call it? Like a um, a those a paddles. Shovel? No, it looked like a wooden oh, cricket. paddle, like, like a cricket, cricket bat. Yeah. I saw that. Yeah, what was, was like, Don't kill me or something like that. It looked like one of the guys from the plane. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. Yeah, yeah well, I, I agree with you, but I I think there's going to be moments of that. Yeah, it's that's it's not like the campaign's not like make or break for Battlefield. That's not why I play Battlefields, but because it's World War One and we, it's like very unexplored in games and like, uh, you know, in, in literature it's explored, but even in movies, it's kind of like not always there. It's not the, it's not like a good versus evil thing. Like World War Two, it's not like a more recent, like Hurt Locker where it's something a lot of people live still relate to. we like past, I think the last person that was fought in World War One died recently, semi recently in the grand mm. scheme of things. So it's, it's a war that's very much past, but, it still was a very bloody conflict. Like rules exist today in war because of how bad this was, right. and the world exists today because of the effects of like new borders and everything. Uh, so I'm interested if they're gonna maybe not take advantage of the terrible term, but like maybe if they can like utilize that in a meaningful way in the campaign. It's tough, man. It's wishful thinking, I would say, but yeah, I don't know. I guess we'll see. The trailer is kind of encouraging, but at the same time, kind of not encouraging. Don't let me bring you down. I think it looks good. I just, I just want to measure our excitement. It looks like it'll be no, exciting. Sure. It's, a, it's a good trailer, right? Like that's yeah. what it is. It is. It's, it's, a, it's, it's ex- exact. Yeah, it's exciting. I'm, I mean, I'm one of many people who are playing this just for the multiplayer. Uh, but to have a campaign that is, you know, enjoyable. I'm not, I'm not expecting like a history lesson. I think we all kind of knew that coming into this game, like from day one. Sure. Uh, they said, they said, yeah. like in an interview, uh, Alex Grinnell, the producer, said, they're, "We're not trying to make a documentary." Yeah. And I hate saying that word because everybody makes fun of me for it. But yeah, they're, we're not, they're not trying to make a documentary. They're not trying to, it's like, it's historical fiction for all intents and purposes. They're going to use the setting and whatnot to tell their own story. And we'll see how that story goes. I'm pretty sure though, the history books did have a horse with a flamethrower guy and a minigun guy <laughs> no, on yeah. top of it. But I'm laser. pretty sure I saw one That's of those great. going into the battle. Yeah, I love that. <laughs> yeah, someone said like, uh, the, the joke was like, um, <laughs> It's kind of a politically charged joke, but it showed like the GIF, and then someone had said, uh, "Oh, but putting women into this game was too unrealistic." Because <laughs> <laughs> that was their quote from like a year ago when they first released it. Uh, cool. So that's Battlefield One. It releases on PS4, Xbox One, PC on October 21st. So what do you think of the new trailer? Let us know what you think. Let us know what you think about the uh, the upcoming campaign. Let us know in the comments below. Rob Hanley, thanks for coming on. Gonna Thank have to you boo for you having off. me. We're gonna get Eric Tay on and talk about Destiny. No, we are. He's heated. <laughs> Dude, he's got some ammunition already. He's always heated. He's pissed. He's pissed about this <laughs> six I gave it. <laughs> he's been doing. He's been like doing a speed bag in the background to Eye of the Tiger to come on and debate me about this. Did you? Uh, did you play any Rise of Iron, Pete? No. 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 I'd like to. I remember you tried playing with the Taken King, but got bored. No, I tried playing. I played the <laughs> the Destiny beta, and then I tried playing when it actually came out, and I got bored very fast. Yeah. No, Eric Tay, you've been playing a lot of Destiny, Man, Rise played, of Iron, the expansion. Yes, I have. I yeah. played Destiny like 10 years ago when I played Fantasy Star Online. Uh, I got you. to say that. All <laughs> right. <laughs> Destiny, Rise of Iron. Our review's up. I did a review in progress on release day uh, after you had done a 10-hour live stream. Mm-hmm. I played a, less of it that morning, but then you know got up my initial opinions, which I think we aligned more initially. Yeah. Um, and then the farther into it we got, the more our opinions diverged. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's just our, I mean, I think we both felt the same way, uh, everything leading up to the raid. I didn't dispute the kind of the score that you were like hovering around at that time, which is ultimately the score you gave it. And it, and I could see that like it, 
there, the slog or the grind of you know you after you get through most of the story which was good again but short and uh, after that it's kind of like this slow process of slowly leveling in the hopes that you can then get to the raid um and when you get to the raid which is uh you know something you did and i did uh, i thought it was a pretty great raid there's probably like one boss that i didn't care too much for uh but it's all a perspective of like how much does that raid impact you right mm -hmm. like is that enough to elevate it to a seven is yeah it not um, and that's kind of where I think our paths mm -hmm. kind of uh, forked in the road, so to speak. But what, uh, without spoiling too much, what did you think of like the raid bosses and the mechanics of the raid? Sure, I thought it was fun. I mean, it was. I don't know if it's just because me and my some of the guys that I raid with normally just haven't raided in a while. Mm -hmm. But uh, the genuine, the genuine excitement of kind of going into it together, for the most part, blind. I, I did look up some strats and stuff like that, but. Like actually doing some of those things, like the raid mechanics and whatnot, it was like pretty refreshing, pretty fun. It was some of it is tied into like what you did before the raid, like mm -hmm. in the strikes and stuff like that, but not all of it. Like some of those mechanics lend itself into the raid, but I thought the raid was a lot of fun. I think the mechanics were fun. I think visually some of the set pieces in there are just yeah. like stunning. Mm -hmm. I'm just like, wow, that just like blow me away. Like and I don't want to get too spoilery with it, but there are some some areas like within and outside of inside and outside of the raid that are like pretty crazy. I wish there was a strike in this expansion that kind of used the same assets and aesthetic and uh, kind of general idea of this raid. Because the closest they got was uh, what is the uh, Anarchy Heist? I think I'm screwing that up. But the ogre and the art, the arch priest. So strike. Like again? The, or, oh, the other one. Yeah, the yeah, new yeah, one. Yeah, the, the actual new one. The that's actual not a new one. Yeah, yeah. 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 Which was a good strike in my opinion. I like that boss fight. Just be, it's it's nothing like spectacular, but it's you yeah. know like the ogre's attacking you. You you realize pretty quickly he's immune, uh, the entire fight. So mm -hmm. then you have to kill the archpriest while this ogre is charging you. I like that boss fight. I like the mechanic, the the damn the dynamic between those yeah. two. And the level of design for that one was pretty like different than most yeah. of the other strikes because it had you going going up and down and left and right. Um, but yeah, it would have been kind of cool to see some of the the more raid kind of like style in mm -hmm. like a strike or something. Something that maybe. Uh, in the previous uh, expansions, I feel like they kind of like led you towards the raid in a yeah, way. Yeah, like prepped where, you for it. Yeah, it's kind of like, oh, like there's, you know, a specific, like one of the bosses you might fight, he runs away, you yeah. know, and you kind of have to go chase him down. And Or with uh, the with with Servitor, you, you know, you have to move the orb while he's like rotating this wall. It's all about placement kind of, which raids mm -hmm. are often about like platforming and kind of being in the right spot at the right time and yeah. like actually not getting wiped in one hit. But uh, it was one of the earlier bosses, again, without spoiling too much, earlier bosses in the raid that kind of, you're not just fighting it, you're also kind of using it as, like, transportation almost. Uh, the I mean, it's not going to spoil it to call yeah. it. the Death Zamboni. The Death Zamboni. And that's the name of the boss. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, Death Zamboni. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I like this game. It's, uh, yeah, you <laughs> you should have given it a seven. You're, just Wayne Gretz, you're Wayne Gretzky mm. with a giant battle axe going oh, at the Zamboni. Man. Don't clean my rink. No. <laughs> okay, that, um, there's definitely none of that. <laughs> no, not at all. Um, but yeah, what do you think of the strikes? Because, like I said, I like the actual new strike, but... Mm. Uh, you know, Sepix Perfected, the one we see right here, is Sepix Prime, but, you know, just mm -hmm. like, uh, what, now he's a splicer, SIVA yeah, has like infected him, they're route. trying to use SIVA, um, we talk more about, like, SIVA yeah. being that nanobot plague mm -hmm. that the Lords of Iron, back in the day, with Lord Saladin, who you'll see if you ever did, like, Iron mm -hmm. Banner, Crucible, uh, Crucible events, this all doesn't make sense, it's just, like, PvP stuff that happens on a <laughs> weekly basis or whatever, uh, uh, like a scheduled basis, they go into the backstory with that. Uh, we can talk about the actual storyline campaign later, but, you know, SIVA is this nanobot plague that plays into some of the strikes and it changes the enemies, kind of like how the uh, Taken enemies perform differently. Mm -hmm. I didn't feel like the Splicer enemies were that much different this time around. They were just, you know, buffed in terms of uh, damage and uh, defense. Yeah, uh, I mean, in, I, I agree with cases. you for that, for the most part on that, in, the, in that regard, that the Taken, when they had done the Taken, felt like there was more stuff happening with that than there is with the Splicers. Um, so, and, and to talk about the strikes too, it does kind of suck a little bit that they were just kind of some rehashes. I mean, it's kind of hard regardless, but I mean, I still enjoyed the, the Sepix like encounter that last encounter, even though it's kind of similar to what it was before, but some of the mechanics at least were kind of cool. It's like, you know, you get a scorch cannon to then take a shield off. That's like something that you would see in like a MMO, you mm -hmm. know what I mean? And the music during that. Like fight is just like amazing. I don't think enough people talk about how amazing the music is, even though that's just one small part of the mm -hmm. game. But like that song, that that song is kind of the same as it was before, but like more like kind of metal and whatnot, and, and it's just like awesome. But yeah, 
Yeah, the, the the enemies didn't feel that much different this time around. Um, Even the so, plague lands, yeah. the new patrol zone, it there was more to do, and it was a different area, but it was still very much just like the Earth from Destiny Year One and Two. It was, yeah, I, I mean, didn't feel only... like I was seeing anything new. Like the Dreadnought, I loved in Taken King. It was very much this like infested kind of foreign like just derelict vessel in the middle of Saturn's rings that you were going into. And there's like new public events. That's when they introduced uh, the Court of Oryx. Court of Oryx. Yep. And then there's, you know, Archon Forge in this one, which is kind of like a reworked Court of Oryx in a way, like nine player, max nine player yeah. public event. I didn't feel like the Plague Lands were offering that much new, like for me to explore. I was exploring them mostly for that quest line where you're actually trying to complete all the missions for uh, Shiro, the hunter. Yeah. What do you think of like the new area? Well, areas yeah, I think part of the reason why the plague lands probably doesn't seem as cool when you go through it as just like an area is probably because you're going through a lot of that through the story. I I would imagine. Um, so you kind of go, oh, I've kind of been here uh, before, whereas it wasn't always the case with like the other expansions and whatnot. So I could see why that felt that way. And there is only one kind of like new patrol. Uh, mission, which is a fun one because you get to use the axe. But mm-hmm. I mean, like, other than that, you're just kind of like killing stuff. And mm-hmm. Archon Forge is an interesting concept. Well, not really, I guess, because it's like re- <laughs> it's it. That's it, that's it's, my it's because sentiment it's like, with most of this expansion. <laughs> it's because it's like a watered down version of like Court of Orcs. They wanted something <clears throat> like faster paced that like it resembled more of like a horde mode, not something that you had to be super strategic about. Yeah. It was more of like a lot of stuff's coming at you. Mm-hmm. Like frantically, you have a timer of five minutes, you have to kill stuff fast. And that's kind of the concept of that. But mm-hmm. I think because it went from like you doing Court of Orcs where there were mechanics of like, oh, if you don't bring the two knights together, you can't damage them. Or um, there's three wizards. If you don't kill them all within a timely manner, they start to respawn. So like there, those probably seemed more interesting than just killing a bunch of stuff. But I yeah. don't know. Maybe some people like the horde style mode. So mm-hmm. maybe that's why they went with it. Our Archon's Forge is kind of like an eh. And they didn't really do themselves a big favor because you can't stack those offerings. Um, so people can't really chain them if you don't have them or like if the group doesn't have them. Whereas like in court, like, you know, you could be there with three people and you could just keep doing it and keep doing activities. But, um, for whatever reason, they kind of like gated you from like doing them like over and over. We were talking about it earlier with the division, but, um, with the update 1.4, it's apparently Mm going to like revamp how you level up a little bit. Um, with like, at least from my experience, someone who kind of had to catch up right before it came out with my light level, it felt very much more like a very, very gradual like very grindy now with like okay should i should equip all my even if i don't like these guns i'm going to equip my things to get my highest light so next thing that drops will you know ideally be higher light lift my light level and it was just like constantly playing that getting in strike playlists and going through the same you know a few strikes and obviously you know which strikes work best and what would like drop the like class specific items and whatnot but it felt i know that the grind is part of destiny i do enjoy it initially but um after a while this was just too much almost yeah this this one was definitely a bit grindier than the ones in the past but it kind of it's kind of part of it is because they came out with that april update which was like the infusing of light kind of stuff which a lot of people were happy about right and i think they wanted to carry that forward so you can still use the old items that you liked <laughs> and bring them up to current light level but i think in doing that because you know you still have to get to like raid level mm-hmm they probably had to find a mechanic to like buffer you from getting there too fast because if you get there too fast then like what do you have left to play right like that's the thing with destiny is that yeah you have your chores and stuff like that but if you get to end game right away like in a week which some people have you're not there's not much left to do outside of the the stuff in the book which again is still gated like you still can't finish that stuff unless like you do it so it's like kind of like extending the life of it but at the cost of kind of making players like grind through that stuff like it's kind of an unfortunate circumstance where like it's already hard enough to get a raid group right because that that mechanic's not necessarily in the game yet but they have community sites and lfg stuff on their site to to help facilitate that but like to get to the light level to do that which even was like a little bit of a struggle for you at first because you know that is a slog a Mm -hmm. little bit even though you are getting rewards it's just minimal like Mm -hmm. it feels minimal you know and it so it takes time like that is uh, kind of shitty to me like i want more people to be able to do the raid but then it's like how do you find the balance like as a raid person i feel like an elitist and it's weird for me that goob like <laughs> goob shoe right who is a GameSpot fan is like almost as high light level as me and it has like he's done like only two parts of the raid mm-hmm. you know what i mean whereas in the past it was like oh 
you get to the, the point where you're stuck, you have to raid yeah. and then you're either hired because of the raid. So then like, where is the balance there? Right? Like, do you try to, it, it's becoming more of a casual game. I feel like, I mean, even if they kept it as extended as it is, right. It sounds like if the strikes are more original and like, especially the, the bosses that you were fighting, like that, that sort of could have provided that balance that you're talking about where it's like, okay, I'll take a longer raid if that's what it takes to keep me playing. If initially I was given things that were super interesting, but it sounded like you had to go through stuff that was recycled content to get to something that was just stretched out needlessly. Yeah, well, even in the strike playlist, you'll be playing to like grind through the strike playlist, keep your strike yeah. bonus. You'll be playing strikes from year one and two because they're put into. Oh, the, gotcha. Yeah. Oh, it, well, wow. the nightfall this week wasn't the new strike, right? Uh, the nightfall last week, week yeah, was yeah. the new strike. But then this week, uh, it was like winter, sh- winter's run. But then they've changed yeah. it again to saber now. But yeah. So yeah, in general, you're. It's not just like that. Expansions content is re- reskinned old content. Destiny's you're playing nature. old content as yeah. well in, okay. in order to like. You know, like success, the grind is successfully real, grind. Right. Yeah, the grind is real. Um, and then in terms of campaign, it's kind of the same thing as Taken King. It serves mainly to set up the late game quest lines or the exotic quest lines, or the new quest givers, the new area, the new social area, uh, the new patrol area, which is the plague lands in this case. Uh, Fell Winter Peak was kind of cool. It was just like aesthetically, it's like Game of Thrones, kind of mixed with Lord of the Rings, that high fantasy stuff. Um, the like, intro cinematic was gorgeous, but it was one cinematic. I, and then you beat the campaign in ninety minutes. You get the blade at the end, the exotic item. It's not really a spoiler. I think most people know that by this point, but um, it wasn't. There wasn't much context to the missions aside from what the quest giver told you at first. Again, like uh, I didn't get into this just to play the campaign, but the campaign, like you know, during the marketing, everything before it looked pretty badass. And then I played it, it was kind of you know like lackadaisical. I didn't. I don't remember much of it. I like the. Uh, I love the Gallahorn quest line. That last mission with Gallahorn was great. Uh, it felt kind of like something out of Bungie's uh, Halo days, like the scale of it. Um, then there's a few, uh, I don't know, I didn't get Kavostok, the original rifle yeah. you get in Destiny, but the exotic quest lines, uh, as always, were pretty entertaining, uh, despite the fact that some of the quests in those lines were just like fetch quest patrol missions. Yeah, but that's like that's, part of, the, that's just how that kind of like, how quests work. If I mean, I never want to call Destiny an MMO, but like those patrol missions, those kind of quest line kind of stuff, like picking up medallions that are all over like the playlands. That's a very like MMO thing to do. Yeah. yeah but um, it's not really worth giving it a pass though. Right? I think sure. it's a fair criticism well, to say it's like, yeah, it's traditional and that's kind of boring. Sure. But, but it, but I guess I have a different perspective on it. It's because it's like, yeah, I wasn't that thrilled about having to pick that stuff up, but it's kind of like the, you can see the light at the end of the tunnel and like it makes it, I, I don't know if it necessarily makes it more rewarding to know that I did all that to get the Gallarhorn, but you know that you earned it, right? And, like, you know that someone else that has a Gallarhorn went through that same thing. Um, but, yeah. And then the Kavostov thing was cool. Like, there's, like, this heartfelt moment that if you've been playing Destiny since, like, year one, like, there's a nice little, like, s- like little nugget of uh, story, like, intimacy between you and the ghost and just, like, kind of, like, looking back at like, you know, the two years that you've been playing yeah. Destiny and like, hey, you know, but yeah. Uh, Group Shoe Ryan in the chat said, hey, wait, I got to Axis Phase 2. Check your facts, Eric Tay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, so that is Rise of Iron. Uh, yeah, the review's up on GameSpot. Gave it a 6 out of 10. Uh, it's, I think it's worth playing if you want to grind and you want to get the new gear, obviously, if you're a hardcore Destiny fan. The raid is well worth it, or the raid is well worth playing the raid. If yeah. it's worth the grind, it's up to you. Um, but yeah, that is Destiny. Um, Rise of Iron, it's out on PS4, Xbox One right now. Uh, we still have the giveaway right after. Uh, GameSpot is going to be tweeting out photos of things from TGS that Mary Kish and Alexa got through customs. Um, Curry, like a... Uh, Valsim, baby. Chocolate crunch, stuff like this. You know. Geek life. Kingsglaive stuff. soundtrack, I believe. Yep. So stuff like that. Just retweet it if you want this stuff. Maybe it'll go to you. We don't know. Probably be a, a lot of people retweeting it, hopefully. Are those individual items? They are, I believe. I think there's going to be photo, maybe maybe groups, but I think it's just going to be individual items that, uh, you know, like retweet if you want that. So, yeah, cool. That's the giveaway. And uh, Rob Hanley, right after the stream, we're just pretty much going to pick up with Rob Hanley's uh, Forza Horizon 3 stream. So get ready for that. Yeah. I'm ready. Cool. My body is ready. Pete Brown, Eric Tay, thanks for coming on. What do you guys, uh, what do you have going on this weekend? Well... Uh, we maybe just got a certain something in that requires a lot of attention. Oh. Uh, yeah, we got PlayStation VR in. 
Cool. So I've got to spend a lot of time reviewing the games and experiences for that before I jet set off to the other side of the globe. Yeah. Aaron yeah. Aaron had brought up the idea of like Rob coming onto the set with it on, but then he would have ran into some kind of expensive equipment. It would Which not have I would have out. liked to see. That would have been good for us I mean, from a comical <laughs> standpoint, from like a financial standpoint for the studio, it wouldn't have been good. And maybe yeah. Rob would have gotten injured, but that's not important. Well, Eric, hey, you can keep playing. <laughs> you can keep playing Destiny. Uh, yeah. I am. Um, probably not as crazily as I have the last week. I'll do my raids and stuff like that. It's it's still like a social game for me. Like if you played COD with your buddies or whatnot, you just hop on and do that. So I'll still do that. And then, you know, whatever live streams we have going on and, you know, one of our good buddies is, you know, Tying the knot. Oh, that's weekend. right. A so, man we know is a getting man married. We know. I don't know. Are we allowed to? I don't know. Okay. All right. Well, someone, <laughs> someone, a former game spot. Yeah. You know, a former game spot. Well, if the grind in Destiny is not satisfying you, you got the division public test servers for uh, update 1.4. Another game I know you love the grind in. Anyway, cool. <laughs> so yeah, stick around for the Forza Horizon 3 live stream right after this, as and then keep an eye on the GameSpot Twitter account. Maybe you can win some of those hot TGS items Alexa and Mary brought back. Oh, and it looks like one of them is autographed. It is. Uh, I do not know who that's autograph. I don't autograph recognize the autograph. Um, we will. I'll, I'll tell the social team <laughs> to mention it in the in the tweet. Anyway, yeah, uh, I will be not be here like next week. Actually, Pete is going to be hosting. I'm going on a, a trip until Tuesday. So Pete Brown taking over. Yeah, I'll pronounce you words correctly. Before. I'll use classic terms for things in video yeah, games exactly. and not latch on to new facts. He'll nitpick me. <laughs> anyway, thanks so much for joining us, and we will see you next week at 2 p.m. Pacific, as always documentary.